This is the famous Wang Fu Jing street market in Beijing 10 years ago. This is how it looks like today. In the decades since both of us last wandered through Beijing, the changes to the city is truly remarkable. For this video, we'll not only explore the city's stunning evolution, but also delve into the vivid contrast between its then and now. So if Beijing has ever been on your travel list, let us share with you how this city has truly evolved. If you do not know about us yet, we are Aaron and Shar, and over the past year we have been travelling across Asia and Australia from our home base, the sunny Singapore. At the start of this year, we had this humble idea to document our travels on this YouTube channel, and we have no idea where this will take us. But we are driven by curiosity, wonder, and the sheer thrill of discovering new places. So come along and join us on this journey as we travel across the wall, one journey at a time. Three, two, one. We just visited China for the first time since the pandemic. So much has changed. After all, it's our second time in Beijing. I've been there in 2009. And I was there in 2014. Time flies. This was back in 2009 and I remembered I was in an immersion program through my secondary school. It is a six weeks program. And during these six weeks, we are immersed in the local culture. We're visiting a lot of different places, including the Great Wall, including the Palace Museum. Every other day, we were visiting attractions. And part of the immersion program gives us the opportunity where we immerse ourselves in the local school and we learned wushu, we learned table tennis, we were taking up classes alongside Chinese students in the secondary school that we were affiliated to. And we spent a lot of time exploring the city. Back in 2014, I visited Beijing with my family and my family friends. And we visited many of the attractions that we visited in this trip. To be honest, I don't really remember what I visited back then, but I do remember walking around not knowing the significance of like the places that I was at. Something I remember was that I couldn't get used to the food in Beijing. Like, I just, it just tasted a little different. I just couldn't get used to it. So for this trip, we travelled with my parents. In fact, it's their first time in Beijing. My dad's lifelong ambition was to visit the Great Wall of China. And I'm just glad he did it. We tried a lot of food and we visited a lot of places. I think we averaged about like 20 to 30,000 steps a day. And we also visited some of the newer places that sprung up within the last 10 years. There's a massive ton of things that have changed. I think it's fair to say that from a technological front, we needed to use a lot of QR codes. Everywhere we go, we had to use QR codes and we had to use the apps, such as Alipay, WeChat or like Meituan. So you have to use these apps to scan the QR codes to order food, to rent a bike, to take the public transport like the metro or the bus and even booking of the high-speed rail. Within each of these Alipay, WeChat or Meituan apps, there are also mini apps as well that allows you to order food at the particular restaurant. So there's no other way to actually order food except for through these apps. And for us as a tourist, getting anywhere without these apps is quite difficult. And because of how prevalent QR codes are and how dependent we are on the use of these apps, a lot of these apps actually requires us to register our particulars, including our phone number. It was a little bit challenging for us as tourists. Most of them will require you to use a Chinese phone number. Because if you don't have a local number, it makes it a little bit more challenging to get around. And for us, it was a little bit challenging to actually try to read these apps in Mandarin. Not because that we do not speak Mandarin or speak Chinese. We found that it was a little bit slower to actually try to read these Mandarin texts and Chinese texts in a small phone. It took us a little longer to order food, for instance. So as visitors, we also faced some other issues such as linking our cards to these apps. Before we visited China, we wanted to link our cards to these apps and we actually faced some issues. Not all foreign cards are accepted by these apps and we wouldn't know until we arrived there and then we realised like, oh, we need to change the card and then we need the OTP. And for the first few days, I actually had some issues with my card or with the app, I do not know. So every time I tapped onto the bus or the metro, they would double charge my card. 
and I was like very confused like why why was that happening so I contacted the customer service on the apps and they actually responded very quickly like I resolved the whole thing and got the refunds within like 10 minutes I was so impressed with this increased use of these digital tools it also means that your phone has to be somewhat charged or at least you have 1% battery in there without these battery and without internet connectivity as well it's really difficult for you to get around from a place to another so if we did rely on wi-fi only we couldn't get around easily speaking of apps another thing that we noticed when we were taking the taxis there was that the drivers were using a map app that actually told them how the traffic conditions are to, to a very high level of precision at a red light the app would actually tell them how many seconds to the green light i was like so amazed the assistance that the app provided the drivers was just like another level and also these apps tells you where the speed cameras are another thing that made me feel that it's a little bit different from 10 years ago was the aspect of security the aspect of safety in fact Beijing definitely feels a lot safer today than 10 years ago. I remember 10 years ago, my parents would be telling me, like, beware of pickpockets, beware of homeless people, beware of losing your stuff and you never ever get it back afterwards. But, <laughs> but this time around when we were there, the impression of being safe is very different like compared to 10 years ago because we don't have to face as much of these fears today as compared to before. And I think a large part of that is because many of the payments are mobile payments right now, so people don't really carry cash. So you don't feel like you will be pickpocketed. It's almost kind of discouraged to use cash. When we actually tried paying certain things in cash, they give an eye at us. Like, cash? Like, and then they know that we are tourists. <laughs> do you have change? And that it took a long time for them to get changed as well. Yeah. Another aspect of this is because we have this impression that there is a tighter security check. Like almost every attraction that we go to, there is some form of airport style security line. Yeah, and we have to allocate more time for each attraction because we will have to take 10 to sometimes like even 30 minutes to get through security. And one other thing about security is that there's also random spot checks too. So it's a hassle for us because like we're not used to travel around with our passports and these random spot checks could happen on the street, walking down a famous tourist district and police will come up to you and ask you like, can you show your documentation or show your passport? And as a tourist, you have to carry your passports around quite frequently. Shara, do you want to talk about AMAP? Yeah, so we were using one of these navigation apps that a lot of the locals use called AMAP and we noticed that there was this feature that was pretty interesting that I've never seen before. Let's say you want to get from point A to point B. The map tells you how many percent of that route is lit up. Another thing that I noticed was that as we were walking along the parks, especially at the Beihai Park area, the lamppost had these intercoms which you can call security if you need. And electric cars. There are so many electric cars everywhere in Beijing. It's so insane. The streets were so peaceful and I couldn't figure out why. Initially, I thought it was that the cars weren't honking as much which made the streets very peaceful. But then Aaron's parents pointed out that most of the cars on the road are actually electric vehicles which meant that the engine sounds just weren't there. And the other thing that we also observe is that like the number of petrol kiosks or like gas stations in Beijing like we only saw one across the entire seven days of our trip. There's only one. Like, can you believe it? Like, one petrol kiosk that services the entire city. Yeah, but on the other hand, we noticed that there were a lot of electric charging points, even at the hutongs. They're just everywhere. And it goes to show how much rapid transformation has taken place in the car industry over the past 10 years. Other than the electric car charging stations, we also saw a lot of battery lockers and these lockers are actually used by the electric motorbikes so they would go to the lockers, they would take out their battery and replace with the charged batteries from these lockers so it's like instantaneous charging it's the first time that I've ever seen such a technology I'm not seeing as much in Singapore at this point of time but like it's very predominant in Beijing there are also a lot of street food vendors I remember in the streets in Beijing right after the 2008 Olympics when I was there I don't see a lot of them right now I remember getting Yang Ro Chuan beside the dormitory that I was living in I would used to order 20 or 30 Yang Rou Chuan to share with my friends during the entire immersion program and now like these Yang Rou Chuan stores that uh, used to be very predominant around Beijing now it's no longer there 
Another thing that we notice is that there are so many subway lines now. There are almost 30 subway lines. How do they even name all these lines? They are naming from like number one, number two, number three. So e hao xian, er hao xian, sang hao xian, all the way to like er shi hao xian, right? So like there's 20 over lines that are named by numbers. However, are there even as many colors to begin with? If it's a purple line or purple color on the map, light purple, dark purple, maroon, violet. What kind of purples are we going to choose? At some point of time, I feel like they are going to run out of colors to use. The map will just be a kaleidoscope. And many of these subways or these metros have a classification. So I was kind of impressed to enter a carriage or a car that is called Tiang Long versus Ruo Long. So you can choose which part of the train cart that you want to go for a stronger win or a less strong win. I think it's really interesting, right? Like I've never seen this kind of concept like anywhere in the world. Yeah, so in, in other countries, the carriages are split by like women only and mixed. But in China, they split it by the strength of the wind. <laughs> <laughs> in Beijing. Yeah, in Beijing. Yeah, just in Beijing. So another thing that we were lucky about is by the time we entered China, China actually lifted most of its COVID restrictions. Before August 2023, visitors into China still have to take a COVID test, uh, the ART kits, before entering China. But this time around, we didn't actually need to take a COVID test. Something that caught us off guard was that after the plane landed in China, they made an announcement to call out a few passengers which were randomly selected for a COVID test. Yeah, I was kind of scared because like I was kind of not actually prepared for that. You also have to do a lot of health declarations before you enter the country and upon exiting the country. So it's kind of like a hassle to actually fill in all this declarations because you have to go through all the details input your passport number input your name input like the place of travel input so many different things it's kind of a pain actually yeah but once we got into the city center of Beijing we noticed that actually most people don't wear masks anymore a lot of people are still riding bikes. Even though public transport is very, very efficient, bikes is still seen as a very common way of getting from one place to another. In fact, that's probably the most common form of transport across Beijing. There's e-bikes, motorcycles, shared bikes, personal bikes, PMDs, all these kind of bikes gets people around very, very quickly. Another thing that is very prevalent around Beijing are the public toilets. These toilets are free, but the conditions vary from one to the other. At some point of time, especially early on in the trip, we were doing this thing called toilet spotting. <laughs> where we kind of wanted to determine whether or not that particular toilet or this particular toilet is cleaner. And if there's privacy or if there's hand washing, etc. We would drag what kind of toilets would be more suitable for our use. So even if we didn't need to use the toilet, we would just go in walk one round and take a look <laughs> just for our own information I mean it's kind of funny actually the best toilets are still the ones that are in the shopping malls especially the shopping malls that are slightly newer so we also see a lot of people actually speeding on the floor as well pretty gross to be fair I do not know if habits are going to change I'm pretty sure it will we also noticed that there are still a lot of people smoking even indoors around Beijing. Non-smoking places are kind of hard to find, especially if you are in eateries or if you are in the hotels. If you are there already consuming your food, you do not know your next door neighbour is going to take a smoke. It's kind of a common practice there to smoke indoors, especially in these areas. And part of it is that like they have also been discouraging smoking in museums or in shopping malls. In fact, in museums that, like the Palace Museum that we went, smoking is completely discouraged. They even like take your lighters and tell you to deposit it in the storage area and claim it afterwards. So you couldn't smoke in these attractions. And speaking of smoke, there is still a lot of air pollution. It feels like we are in a movie set sometimes, right? Like yeah. as, as if there's a lot of like fog, <laughs> as if there's a lot of dry eyes, but in fact these are all smog. I think it's really part of the geography as well as the industry that contributes to a lot of these air pollution, not the electric vehicles anymore or less. Yeah, even though there's smog all around and it looks rather dark, we still need sunscreen because when we walked around we realized that the sun is actually heating very hard on our skin and sometimes we will get sunburned. Absolutely. There are so many attractions in Beijing and most of them are so huge. So spreading out these attractions into multiple days across your itinerary would be a very good idea. 
And one of the places to go to is the Great Wall of China. Of course, that is the most famous place in the entire China, I would suppose. Yeah, I mean, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, right? And it's one of the seven wonders of the wall. Right, yeah. So that's the must-visit place if you really want to be all inspired. And in fact, we have been there twice. Once to Pa Ta Ling and once to Mu Tian Yu Changchun. The last time round, we were there, we are at Mu Tian Yu Changchun, which was less crowded. And this time round, because we wanted a different experience, we decided to get to Pata Ling. It's a big, big, big mistake. The Pata Ling section of the Great Wall of China is one of the most convenient sections to get to. Right now, there is a high-speed rail to get from the city centre to Pata Ling and it takes about 30 minutes. But we didn't realise that we had to book these high-speed rail tickets in advance. By the time we decided to purchase the tickets, it was all sold out. So we had to find other modes of transportation to get to Pata Ling Changcheng. I mean, one of the other ways to get there is by buses. There are two kinds of buses, the public buses as well as the private chartered tourist buses by the city of Beijing. Of course, the public buses are much cheaper. It takes one and a half hours to get from city centre to Pata Ling Changcheng. It's pretty fast. Yeah, but we just have to try to get there early because by the time it gets to about 8 or 9 a.m., there's a little gem forming. And these are just one stop, right? Like, there's not multiple it's stops. It's a direct bus from the city, either from Tianmen or Tashengmen. Another must-visit attraction is the Forbidden City, also known as the Palace Museum. The Forbidden City is in the literal centre of Beijing City and it's probably one of the most visited attractions in the whole world. The palace used to be the place where emperors of the Ming and Qing dynasty used to live. It's called the Forbidden City for a reason. Even Beijing locals back then couldn't enter the city. Only the emperors, the people who were working in the palace and the foreign delegations. We spent about 4 hours at the Forbidden City but we still didn't manage to explore the whole palace. And the best route to take is to travel from the south of the Palace Museum all the way to the northern exit. And another attraction to go to and a must-visit attraction is the Summer Palace. It's called Yi He Yuan Summer Palace. It's at five times the size of the Forbidden City. It took us about five hours or more and we also couldn't finish exploring the entire grounds of the palace. This palace has actually been burned down multiple times and it has been rebuilt since. And it is also very convenient to get there because now there's a subway stop that gets you close by to the entrance. So we also visited Yuan Ming Yuan which is a collection of three different parks and this used to be called the Old Summer Palace. Why is it called the Old Summer Palace? It's Old Summer Palace because the palace was burned down in 1860 because of the Boxer Rebellion. The Old Summer Palace is so big, most tourists only visit the northeast part of this palace where the ruins are. And there's also a subway stop to get there, right in front of the entrance. So there's also other must-visit attractions as well. That includes the Temple of Heaven, which is called the Tian Tan, Tiananmen Square, the Bay High Park, and they are all within the second ring. So it's pretty accessible to get to. Yeah, we just cannot stress enough how convenient it is to go around Beijing. It's just a lot of walking to do. Although I can't remember exactly where I went during my first trip, I still had the same feeling. And it was just that all the attractions were huge, there's a lot of walking, and sometimes I get a little bored to be honest. But somehow all these places have not deteriorated at all. I think they did a very good job in maintaining all these places. I kind of wish I paid more attention during my lessons in secondary school so that I would like better appreciate what happened, like the history of China, the architecture and all that. The 14 years that I haven't visited Beijing, Beijing seems like it evolved tremendously as if 30 years of development has kind of compressed within 14 years it's kind of insane to think about that from this perspective architecture in terms of like the old buildings the old palaces and all those kind of things those might not have changed but yet there's also a lot of new buildings that sprung up in yeah, fact the a lot skyscrapers of, yeah the skyscrapers exactly and those are so beautiful something that i haven't expected that they will grow like to this scale in a short period of time. During my first trip, I couldn't quite appreciate the food in Beijing, but this time I think I was more receptive, like I enjoyed the food more, and we also explored more of the Chinese food around Beijing. And I think part of the reason is that there has been more Chinese food in Singapore recently, and I kind of got used to it. Yeah, your mala tang, right? Yeah, the mala tang, and then there's also the yang chuan here. And a lot of chuan chuan. We also challenged ourselves this time around to actually visit new places as well. For example, we found that 751, 798, those are places that used to be an industrial area, like with the power plants, with factories and heavy industries. 
But now it's completely changed. It's changed to an art district and it's kind of surprising to walk through these areas and to see how art galleries and art museums are now in these areas. And the day when we visited 751 and 798, it coincided with the China Fashion Week. So it's like the biggest fashion event in the entirety of China. So Shar, how many tips do you think we have for first time travellers to Beijing? I think we can give our top five. Top five? I mean, we might have eight of them. Eight really, really good tips for first time travellers to Beijing. So what's your first tip? My first tip is that booking tickets to attractions in advance is very, very important, especially now, right after the pandemic. Yeah, for us, everything was planned this time around by us. I didn't have a tour guide, we didn't go through a school, so everything has to be done by us. I wish that somebody had gotten on behalf of us like how we did it the last time around when we were school kids, but now we had to figure things on our own by ourselves. If you are local there, it's actually very easy to book because you can actually book through Alipay or WeChat or Meituan. But as foreigners, we didn't have our accounts set up yet and we had to find alternative solutions to booking these tickets such as like using their websites and using email. It was, honestly, it was quite a hassle. For example, Palace Museum, right? Yeah. The Palace Museum requires you to book the tickets seven days in advance. We were trying even before seven days on whether or not we can access WeChat Pay or because you had to book the museum tickets through WeChat. Obviously couldn't get to access WeChat Pay from Singapore and so we couldn't get the tickets and we tried asking around for our friends like people who were living in China that didn't come to any good lead and in the end we saw a particular website from the Palace Museum that allowed us to actually email in for these tickets. Yeah, so we had to email in like the date that we wanted to visit, how many of us, and also our particulars, including our passports. And these passport numbers are the only form of identification for entry into the Palace Museum. Another one is the high-speed rail. Because like high-speed rails, those could potentially book up quite fast as well. Especially from big cities to big cities. Like you could book it through Alipay or book it through WeChat, but like as Foreigners, we didn't have access to those accounts, so we had to book it through trip.com. So what's tip number two? So even without phone numbers or local Chinese phone numbers, it is still possible to get by. But without it, it's a little bit more challenging. We need phone numbers to register for tickets, for instance, or for site tickets as well, like within local attractions. Or even ordering food, they will ask for your local number. Without this phone number, it's kind of a little bit challenging for us as tourists. One of the more important things rather, if I could emphasize, is the idea of getting mobile internet. I think that is super essential. Without mobile internet, it is impossible to even get into the subways or get into places or order food as well because you need that around and there might not be public Wi-Fi everywhere we go in Beijing. What's tip number three? Tip number three would be to get to Beijing, you can actually go through Tianjin and then take a high-speed rail down to Beijing. Yeah, that saved us about $300 because getting to Beijing was a little bit more expensive even though like it's very convenient but like $300 is quite some amount of money. And to get from Tianjin Airport to the city centre of Beijing is actually very convenient. There's a high-speed rail which took us about 30 to 40 minutes, super fast, super clean and super convenient. And we also took the opportunity to explore Tianjin as well on our last day before heading back to Singapore. Tip number four, I hope that we did more due diligence during our trip. What we did was the usual googling and all that. We read a lot of blogs, we watched some vlogs. It's still not enough. Many of these blogs and vlogs in English were actually outdated. Yeah, in fact, there's the Wang Fu Tsing Snack Street, right? We saw it on a map and we were walking down like Wang Fu Tsing Street and we just didn't see the street at all. So we thought we like missed it, so we walked back and we still didn't see it at all. So we saw this security guard and we decided to ask him like, where the snack street was and he told us that the snack street was actually closed in 2019 like four years ago and none of the blogs or vlogs even mentioned that even wikipedia didn't update on that i remember going to wang fu jing snack street back then and there was a lot of food to eat and i was pretty impressed by the weirdness of the food that's on display as well like there's crickets there is scorpions those are weird snacks and yeah. we really wanted to try that yeah, I thought it would be our first time trying insects. Well, we didn't have the opportunity this time round, or maybe in the future there might be because across the street, the security guard was saying that something might pop up in a much more enclosed space. So, what's tip number five? 
So that is about language barrier. I mean, English is definitely not a language that most people living in Beijing actually use or employs in their daily way of life. For us, like speaking Mandarin is like the choice of language. Even in Beijing itself, a lot of people actually do not come from Beijing, so they bring their own dialects to Beijing, and this is something that we couldn't really recognize. And the other thing is also about accents too. Like people native to Beijing,、uh, who lived and grew up there, also have their own form of accent too. This accent is very kind of dis- distinguishable. It's very very sophisticated with the er sound at the back. Those are accents that I really couldn't. Really understand, so I strain my ear sometimes listening to a taxi driver. Like, what is he trying to say to us? And we were like nodding our heads and thinking that we actually understood about half the words. Like, we couldn't really understand what he's trying to say. Yeah. So even when we were talking to the, the taxi driver, he couldn't really understand us as well. So we could tell because he took like an extra half a second to reply us. So I'm really sure he was also processing, just like how we also needed to process what he was saying. Yeah, Beijingers tend to roll their words right quite often because the er sound like it's like a pretty nasal way of actually saying things as well. So like I think it's really interesting to have that kind of spread in diversity. Also, there's a lot of Chinese words that we use in Singapore. It's very different from the Chinese words that you use there, especially for regular things that we see on the streets. Like for example, buses. In Singapore, we call it bashi. In Beijing, we call it 公交车 For example, spoon. Can I get a spoon from you? Because there's only chopstick. I would love to have a spoon. Now you ask a waiter or waitress for 汤匙 they wouldn't understand. Like you have to ask for 勺子 And the other one is where's the toilet? Where do you want to find the public restroom? You don't call it 厕所 You call it 卫生房 or 卫生间 So these are the small little words that we had to code switch. Of course, we understood what it means, but the choice of words are actually very different. I would say that I would understand about seventy percent of the spoken Mandarin, which is pretty much of an achievement, right? Yeah, I think I could、you? only understand about thirty percent. So does that make us like hundred percent in total? <laughs> Next, water is not portable in Beijing. Yeah, so on very hot days, we actually found ourselves needing to buy bottled water. Bottled waters are about like two to five yuan, depending on where we were. Definitely, we shouldn't skim on that because it's, it can get pretty hot. Especially during the summer. Yeah. Because we went during the summer, this is Shar's most feared enemy. What? The mosquitoes. Oh yes. <laughs> Tip number seven. There's a lot of mosquitoes, so please bring your insect repellent. So during the summer, especially in the mornings and evenings, the mosquitoes are rampant. Like the only time I know that the the sun is setting is when mosquitoes start biting me. In the end, we had to buy an insect repellent because I I just couldn't take it anymore. The last tip I could think of is really about a very significant cultural difference that I feel that is not prevalent here in Singapore at least, right, and not prevalent elsewhere in the world, and it's about personal space. Right. So, what about personal space? It's very normal to get pushed. It's very normal to get stepped on, especially in your know, tourist regions. Especially when you're queuing for stuff, people are literally right behind your shoulders, super close to you, and it's kind of uneasy for the first couple of days we were there. Yeah, like when people were pushing me from the back when we were queuing for things, I'm just like wondering, like the queue doesn't move any faster if you were to push me. But after a while, I just realized that it, it's it's not that they were trying to offend me or anything. It was just like a way of life. It's very very normal for them to be like very close to one another. So after a while, it got pretty okay. As long as we're in Beijing or as long as we're in China, this is something that's quite predominant there. Yeah. So as a result, we will also need to fit in, and we have to like squeeze with the people in front of us. Otherwise, people would think that there is a space in front, and they want to cut the queue. Yeah. yeah so I just just adapt where wherever we go. So Shah, how much do you think Beijing will change after ten years? At this rate, I do not know, but I do hope that we get to visit Beijing again in the future. So catch how we spend one week in Beijing in our next video.